Hello all, it's Matthew Holt, uh, head of uh, the THCB gang, back with our third episode. Really looking forward to today's edition. It is April the 2nd, uh, day something, maybe day 40, 14, 15, 18, 22, since we've got really panicked about COVID-19. And we know a lot more now than we did last week about what the impact is going to be on the healthcare system, both in the system on the ground and the politics and policy of it. So with that, I'm going to introduce the gang. I'll just tell you quickly who's coming up. You can see him on the screen here. Um, hopefully on my left, or I can ever tell where I showed up. I have uh, Grace Corradovano, um, uh, patient advocate, and from, uh, well, she, she'll explain more about what she does about unlocking healthcare. Kim Bellard, uh, former editor of, <laughs> uh, actually, I'm, I'm not going to say regular contributor to the HCB. I'm going to be up on that. Okay, new to the gang is Dan O'Neill, who is a uh, long history in uh, health tech, but uh, these days they're not a GF fellow. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, and then we get to some old, old lags. Michael Millinson uh, from Health Quality Advisors, uh, regular contributor to the THCB. Vince Caradis and Deb McGraw, who are uh, one a consultant, one now a pushy entrepreneur, <laughs> who, uh, who used to be government, I say used to be government bureaucrat, now pushy entrepreneur at Citizen, where she is a uh, chief regulatory officer. Um, and they are two who write the uh, uh, write the series about privacy on healthcare on the healthcare THCB. And finally, Brian Clapper, all the way from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, um, employer guy plus a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> all right. So I've asked everyone to start off with, and I want to start with you, Grace. What this week uh, have you noticed that's uh, that's really caught your eye in terms of health and healthcare? Ooh, I got two good ones for you. So. Uh, I'm not sure you're allowed to. <laughs> Start oh, with the first one. Go on. oh, okay, wait. So they're related. So, and from as an advocate, I'm working with patients who are in the hospital and their families are trying to triage and manage all this COVID um, really earth shattering situations. Um, it came out that in situations, so again, I'm, I'm in New Jersey, so New York hotspot areas. Um, what happens if they run out of equipment, supplies, ventilators, and doctors need to ration care or make tough decisions? Concerns have come out from patients and their families. Um, I want to make a decision about what happens to me. So who should be making those decisions? And what kind of digital technology can we offer to people who are socially isolating when they have to make a decision? What hospital do they go to? Are the ERs overwhelmed or where are they on supplies? As well as the importance of advanced directives. All right, so it's where, where should you be going? <laughs> um, and what, what would you know about that? All right, Kim. I think it's become more clear that we're pouring, we're worried about over, over utilizing the healthcare system with, with capacity and we're pouring federal money into it. And yet large parts of the healthcare system are also worried about going bankrupt. So it seems like we're getting way too much use and yet way too little revenue. So there's the real dichotomy in some sense. Yeah, we had a piece on TCB this week uh, from Jeff Livingston in, in Texas talking about you know, running a private practice as a physician. Dan, what have you spotted this week that's uh, new and different? Yeah, I'm certainly focused on the same question that Kim flagged, which is the, the, the question of short-term cash flow versus long-term revenue for the healthcare provider space. Um, I'm also intrigued by what we're immediately finding out about the deficits in surveillance and management infrastructure. Right, just by 10 years and tens of billions of dollars of taxpayer money, it's remarkable how little data we have on COVID cases, test volumes, test outcomes across the country. Michael, this week. Well, uh, I'm uh, in the northern suburbs of Chicago and looked at the newspaper this morning and there's something like 50 or 60 COVID cases in my suburb of about 15,000 people. Um, which is pretty uh, amazing, uh, attributed to the fact that many of the folks travel a lot. And I would say looking at the pictures from New York, looking at what's happening in California, Louisiana, to me the most um, kind of uh, uh, impactful thing I've seen is the way that healthcare quickly morphs into medical care, quickly morphs into Maslow's hierarchy of survival. And uh, for all that folks joke about toilet paper and the rest, what you're seeing is people really starting to worry about someone they know or their own family getting this and, and, and dying. And that's what's really concentrated uh, both the political minds, such as they are, and, and the population on, on, on the impact of, uh, of this pandemic. Vince. 
What are you wearing there? <laughs> All right. I'm making a, a, a public service announcement. Wear your masks. My beautiful, lovely wife made me this one. The evidence for helping others is very strong. The evidence for helping you is pretty good. But uh, one issue I want to flag uh, that's become a pet peeve is around the role of technology in surveillance and contact tracing. And I'm seeing uh, tech companies and certainly authoritarian governments phrase the issue as, do you want to have your life or do you want your privacy and civil liberties? Okay, that's the wrong framing of the issue. It needs to be, we want both. They're not mutually exclusive. It's a false dichotomy. I hope we can come back and talk about that later. Yeah, we'll come back and talk about whether I'm morally pure because I gave away some of the N95 masks I had from the California fires a while back, or whether I'm uh, morally impure because I've kept a couple just in case I need them. <laughs> so, we'll ask about that. De Devin, you can either talk about my uh, moral, moral purity or lack of it, or uh, you can tell us what you've seen this week. I'm not touching that one with a 10 foot pole, Matthew, but I will say. Um, you know, OCR's announcement just today, actually, that they are once again exercising enforcement discretion to allow business associates to do public reporting to for public health and to health oversight agencies is enormous. Um, most of those entities don't feel empowered. They feel constrained by their business associate agreements for doing what covered entities are already empowered to do in terms of sharing that data. And a lot of those business associates have a lot of data. An HIE, for example, could do a huge amount of reporting on COVID-19 cases versus having to rely on each individual hospital um, to do that. So I think I thought that was huge. Yeah, we'll definitely come back to that because I've heard a lot this week about who's lying about whose numbers both abroad and here. Brian, what have you noticed this week? Um, well, let me, let me see. Uh, another guy and I, issued a call this week for the nation's insurance companies, health insurance companies to step up and provide 120 days of funding to the independent primary care community, to keep them afloat because they are strangled right now while, while people continue to pay premiums to the health plans. And, mm -hmm. and to keep the, to keep the, the nation's healthcare infrastructure in place, and sustained, we need to we need to have that kind of that kind of cross subsidization happen. The other thing that I've been thinking about is how momentous all of these events that we're going through right now are going to turn out to be for for the structure of our healthcare system in the future and for the structure of our entire social safety net. We're going to have millions and millions and millions of people who don't have jobs companies that go out of business, other companies that are much more constrained in what they have the ability to spend spend money on coming out of this. The healthcare industry is going to come out of this and think that things are going to go back to normal and that they can charge what they've charged before and nobody's going to have that money to pay them. So we have a we have a, a reckoning coming of of catastrophic proportions. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. Maps, I want to get uh, Kim and Dan in the conversation straight away. Uh, we've heard, and, and Brian, we've heard quite a bit already about the uh, what's in the CARES Act. There's $100 billion for hospitals. Um, there was, there's some support for small businesses, but not actually, I can't, I'm not quite sure if it's not for employees. You can't pay employees more than 100,000 who are getting more than 100,000 a year. Maybe you can't have to pay employees up to 100,000. Uh, who were getting 100,000, I'm not sure quite right. how it's going to work out, maybe somebody knows. But um, a lot of, there's no specific line items there for physician practices, as, as just has just been mentioned. So uh, we're hearing also a lot about hospitals losing elective surgery. Some of them are restarting them. UCSF, Bob Walter just said they're restarting some a little bit. Maybe UCSF needs the money, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Dan, Kim, Brian, someone jump in. What do you think the immediate impact of this right now is on the healthcare sector from a revenue standpoint. I do a quick level set on CARES before we dive in. I think. Yeah, please, because I'm sure I got it wrong. <laughs> Whoops. No, no, no. I think directionally right, but just to be precise, there's a couple pieces in CARES that are specific to hospitals. 
For example, there's a 20% increase in the reimbursement, uh, the DRG reimbursement through Medicare for COVID related care. That's pure hospital money, right? There's a postponement of the sequester, which was a 2% cut in hospital reimbursement. That's worth billions of dollars for hospitals. So that's all money that's dedicated to hospitals. The 100 billion that's received a lot of attention is designated for providers and provider is the term of art, which statutorily can be either a physician practice, it can be a lab, it can be a hospital, it can be anybody, right? And there's virtually no parameters from what I've seen uh, around where that goes. So it's sort of up to HHS, who's probably scrambling right now to construct programs. Some of that money can go to physician practices and probably will. What do you think the, what's gonna be the mechanism for getting it there? I mean, I think a lot of physician practices already have basically got over telehealth. By the way, that's another thing. So the telehealth apparently is now being reimbursed, at least for Medicare, I believe, at the same rate as it was as a normal office visit. Um, but what's the what's the sense? Has anyone got a sense about what the mechanisms for doing this? And you know, can the average physician practice, which already doesn't get paid for like 60, 90, 120 days, <laughs> you know, by the insurers for the stuff that actually does and on a fee for service basis, can they sustain this anyway? What do you think is going to happen in the next little bit? Do you want to weigh in? I don't want to, you want to weigh in on that. I don't know how it's going to work. I mean, I think it's sort of like with the small business loans and some of the uh, unemployment things. The the mechanisms for these are to be determined, and I think uh, Treasury told uh, the House today that some loans are going to, some checks are going to take like twenty weeks or ten weeks to get to people. So it's it's easy for them to pass these things, but getting the mechanics in place to do that, if it's not coming through the normal payment mechanisms. I don't know what the mechanisms would do. Our, our practice is going to have to apply for these things the way that small businesses are. Uh, I don't know, and our you know our physician is going to have time to do that. It's it's really interesting that you know um, I think the independent guys are ones in most trouble because the people that are associated with hospitals, you know, they're it's easier to go to one hospital and give them some money and let them figure out how to divvy it up among the various people. But the people that are not affiliated with a larger entity, they may not have the infrastructure or the the wherewithal or they know how to know where to get to the, the money. There is yeah. a quick path, just just for in just in case we have anybody watching who's trying to figure this out for small practice. So there, there's an existing program at CMS that they normally use in the context of hurricanes and the sort of things that can, that can shut down care for a short period of time, where a practice can file a, a report on and they get advanced payments for several months. And that money flows through the existing MACs, the existing ACH information that they already have to pay Medicare claims and can arrive within days or weeks at worst. Well, and you so say that's the working capital solve where a physician practice can very quickly draw uh, all the Medicare money that it would otherwise get paid over the next, through the end of the summer really. I think it's do, do the intermediaries make those payments? Because CMS doesn't really do any payments. The max, the Medicare administrative contractors, the regional max that handle uh, both claims processing and payments. Uh, that's technically where the money flows, but it uses existing wiring. So I'd like, great. I'd like to offer a thought here. So th this morning I watched a webinar put on by the advisory board. They are a uh, company that has a consulting and procurement company that has many of the nation's largest health systems as clients, and they put on what I thought was actually a pretty persuasive case that the hundred plus billion dollars that's already earmarked for hospitals is, is nowhere, nowhere near enough. Uh, I think today we can all sit here and look. Uh, what I'm going to want to see is uh, someone auditing the numbers, someone way beyond Donald Trump. And, you know, we're not, we're, we're not going to have that today, but that's what it, I think, you know, we can't really address this issue today. We got to wait and put the mechanisms in place. Yeah, we've got, we've got a couple of things uh, going here. I want to get comments on both of them. Uh, um, one is, and I know, Dan, you've looked at this. Uh, I mean, back of the envelope, right? Hospital spending is about 900 to a trillion, bit 900 billion to a trillion a year. So 100 billion should be a month plus of everything on the hospital side. That doesn't cover the physician part of it. Um, but I mean, that there should be, and they're still getting money, right? They're still getting paid through Medicare and through private insurance for what they're actually doing. They just may not be making as much with some of the elective surgeries closed down. So whether it, whether 100 billion is enough or not, I think it's an interesting question. And the other one is, is uh, and I wanted, did, did want to hear a bit more from Brian about, uh, before we head off this topic, I want to hear a bit more from Brian about the, 
the concept of, you know, what are you asking insurers to do to help primary care docs and if you, or, or physician practices, and have you heard anything back? So uh, perhaps we can take those two quickly. Yeah, the, um, I think what we're asking specifically is for health plans, which are relatively wealthy, but they're essentially the banks of the system, right. to advance money for, to cover at least 90 days of operating capital to, ind to independent primary care practices that don't have other sources of subsidy to keep the doors open and to make a transition to telehealth as well. Uh, both of those things are important. But the thing to remember though, is that, you know, health plans in any given market typically don't have large market shares. You know, it's unless you're like a, a high mark in, in Pennsylvania or Western Pennsylvania or something like that, it gets paid up pretty quickly. And most of the business is self-employed business. So they can't really control that. So it's harder and harder to do when you drill down about who's got, actually got most of the money that's going to be paying out most of the thing. You know, a Kaiser could do that, but you know, in, in most states, take you know, take a New Jersey or take a, a someplace in the South, it's going to be hard to really get much impact from, you know, well, I mean, all the self-employed You could certainly ask it of the Bukas. I mean, there's no right. question there. And, and there are really only a few organizations that matter until you get to the Blues and the Blues connect pretty monolithically as well. The, uh, part, of, part of the idea of this came from uh, a notice that Blue Cross of Idaho put out that said that they were going to make subsidies to, to the primary care, to independent primary care practices. Even in the blues though, a majority of their business is self-funded business. Sure. Yeah. The, the, but then they have access to those bank accounts. I'm never quite sure. But they, and apparently, well, but they, there was actually a fun. There was a fun case with United in New Jersey, I think, where they were they were accessing that bank account and then not handing on to the providers and getting sued. This was a couple yeah, of months they, ago before this came. You know, up. There's there's risk for them to unilaterally abrogate the contracts and just make payments that the employer thought. I mean, they, they could get sued with those guys. So you know, it's a it's a tricky thing, and people forget about the insurance business that most of the business of insurance is not insurance. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> This goes back to uh, our fragmented system, right? I mean, that this is a classic responsibility of government, right? You, you're a primary care practice and you've got five or six different payers. What unites them is your community, right? And, and Kim is, is correct. So uh, if, if you, and, and, and it shows why some, you know, healthcare in America is so complex, right? So if you go to the, if you go to the Chicago area, the biggest uh, uh, employers, the biggest uh, customers of Blue Cross of Illinois, which is the largest uh, uh, health insurer, our government, right? So you're going to go in this crisis and go to Cook County government or the state of Illinois, which are bleeding money from taxes and bleeding money from everything else and say, now give money to doctors for 90 days. And then you're going to do what? I mean, it just, it just falls apart. And, 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 and so what you need is government community, things like that, because everybody's got their own interest and, and, and it's difficult. Now, uh, uh, on the other hand, you could very easily see some of the larger healthcare systems in uh, 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 Illinois or Chicago going to those independent doctors and saying, hey, wouldn't this be a great time for you to sign on the dotted line with us or go out of business? I'd be <laughs> if you lost that nice practice. You lost so much I'd like time. to throw another tangent on this. We do you a <laughs> So, or, you know, or, uh, or, or if you're a little bit more Machiavellian, uh, if you're a, uh, a charitable private equity uh, firm, <laughs> you're a group of, uh, that's an oxymoron. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> surgeons and offer them a lifeline based on your charitable impulses. So it, it's difficult. All right. So you've uh, also Grace, got Grace is trying to get in here. So Kim, then Grace. So, so I want to just flip, flip it also to the patient side. Uh, there was an announcement by Humana and Cigna that they're going to be waiving all consumer costs that are related to COVID, um, co-insurance deductibles, admissions, which is interesting because you're starting to see on Twitter some of the first wave of patients who are hospitalized that are getting their bills now. Um, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and a lot of these patients, what's interesting uh, because no tests were available, it's just being treated as a hospital admission. So how do you decipher and 
plead the case, well, this was COVID, when people who are in intensive care now in New Jersey, at this point, they're not even testing um, if it's not going to make a difference in your continuity of care. Uh, I have so many questions. Um, I don't think we have enough time to get into all of them, but it's just another interesting thing, waiving all the all the consumer costs at this time. And, uh, Grace, we have as much time as you like. We can keep it forever. But I do. But you're going down a path that's very interesting through to what Devin, I'd love to get Devin on this, Devin was talked about earlier which was, uh, okay, we've got to start counting stuff. There's a bunch of stuff to be counted, including that, yeah, so we're going to have Donald Trump now thinks that 200,000 deaths, it's going to be a great you know, political triumph on his part. How you record those deaths and what does people die of, were they going to die anyway? It's been, it's been like sort of, well, there's been a, a bunch of, fr- not I would say fringe, but a bunch of uh, uh, infectious disease specialists mm. who've been saying, including the guy in France, this isn't this big a deal. Um, because these people are all going to die anyway, right? Which is pretty, pretty callous stuff, but you're kind of hearing that. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty, what are, how are we actually going to count this stuff? What are we going to define? And then actually, how's the counting going to happen? So then, yeah, well, look, look, we are all going to die someday. <laughs> Not me. What? So. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> if anybody didn't know that. By um, the way, you I find out the really awful. crucial stuff on TV. TV, TV guy, right? We are all going to die someday. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I look, I'm no expert on how, um, a, you know, what, how death gets attributed in terms of sort of multiple causes. You know, my understanding is, is there's usually a laundry list of things, right? Obviously, if they're not, if we're not testing people, though, then, you know, it, it does it then argue for when medical staff put down and document the cause of death that they ought to, even in the absence of a test, put down anything that's sort of COVID related in order for us to get sort of a true count of what the, uh, of the impact of this uh, pandemic is and, ha- and has been, so. But, uh, what were you saying before when you came on, you, you, you mentioned that um, OCR was allowing, was allowing, now I would guarantee, guarantee that apart from the exception of you, probably no one that, because you used to run it. <laughs> nobody, on, nobody on the podcast nobody on the right knows what the hell OCR is. So tell us a bit about what, put that in context. <laughs> to, sorry, <laughs> not trying to be offensive. But. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is related to the issue of counting and sort of getting a complete understanding of where we are um, with this pandemic, which is, you know, um, hospitals mostly do public health reporting to, um, uh, you know, to the CDC and to their local health department regarding COVID related measures. You know, Dan mentioned earlier that we don't have great interoperability to facilitate a lot of this data reporting, even though we sunk a lot of money into it. But a lot of the HIEs, you know, the, the health information exchanges, the EHR networks um, built by Cerner, by Epic, et cetera, like they now have access to a lot of data and could facilitate the reporting of that data, but they're business associates under HIPAA. So for a lot of them, whether they can actually make those reports, even though HIPAA allows covered entities to make those reports, whether they could or not was dependent on whether their business associate agreements allowed them to do so. And I don't know that a lot of people had the foresight to think we want HIEs to be doing public health reporting. We want them to be, you know, reporting on, you know, how many cases of X, Y, and Z is going on. So I suspect there's been a lot of business associate agreements out there that either were silent on this issue or said no, like you're, you're here's your swim lane. Here's what you're allowed to do with this data that I'm giving you. Um, and so essentially, what OCR said is enforcement discretion. If you want to report we're gonna let you report and we're not gonna come after you for violating your business associate agreement. You do need to know, let your covered entity customers know you're doing it, number one, and you need to be doing it in a secure way per the HIPAA security rule. So that's what so they said. Never, 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 will we be sure. seeing uh, Ascension, which now has given 50 million or up to 50 million identifiable uh, patient records to Google? Will we see Google? Making it, it will be up to Google because it's not a mandate for Google to report that data um, and really depends on what kind of data they're collecting from Ascension about whether it's relevant for this particular type of reporting that they're talking about. And, and I assume also included. in that I mean, case, business associate. In that case, whether it's how, how live it is, we don't know they're getting a daily, daily feed of data. And, and that heads back to something that Dan raised and I think Kim, you were trying to get in on this, which is the issue of, you know, what's really going on and what, what, what's really happening in the system, how many people are coming in in different hotspots around the country. Um, because there is, we, we, we touched on this last week and a, and a couple of weeks ago, which was what happens, uh, you know, 
in the end, we're talking about overwhelming the healthcare system. That's the, I mean, there are huge problems. The reason we've closed down the economy or a third or a half the economy, and we should get into Brian's point about the impact of that on the healthcare system shortly. Oh, we had a question from Steve Winnell about that as well. But I mean, the reason we've done that is because we're going to try and keep the healthcare system alive rather than just flooding it. Um, so I, I'm still curious as to, we had a lot of counting in California, Gavin Newsom sort of seems to be that we, the governor here said we seem to be successful in, clo in, in slowing the spread and we're doing also, we're doing relatively well, but we haven't actually been testing everybody, so we don't really know, but we're not seeing the, the numbers show up at hospitals in San Francisco or Sacramento or elsewhere. However, we, uh, you know, there are plenty of places where New York City and others were in Detroit where things are getting overwhelmed. Uh, yeah, just toss out there. I would second, strongly second Devin's point here. I, I think this OCR guidance is potentially huge. If I were in a public health agency, my first call would be to a small group of cloud-based EHRs. I want Athena on the phone, eClinical Works, uh, the Carrios, Advanced MDs, Practice Fusions of the world. These guys already have tens of thousands of physician practices on the platform. The data is all in one place from a technical standpoint. Um, and all of a sudden they can now expand case reporting, uh, the frequency of lab orders, the result, the lag in results, because those mostly come back electronically. You can get quasi real-time insight into turnaround times and turnaround times across different labs. And I would also be calling clearing houses, right? There's a little bit of a lag in when a claim gets sent out the door, but between change healthcare and availability, you probably have 80, 90% of all the medical claims in the US going through two switches really three switches because change is sort of fragmented. But nevertheless, very quickly, they could be standing up information that strips out and reports on ICD codes uh, that are on claims hitting the front end of the switch. Um, that could all be a very significant advance from the public health reporting that we have right now. And it has operational implications, even in local markets for how you see the flow of patients hitting the ER and other sites there. De Devin, doesn't HIPAA have some sort of exception for government mandated reporting, particularly public health related things? For covered entities. These are, you know, this is the thing about HIPAA, right? Most of the sort of primary responsibilities that both the benefits and the burdens are for covered entities. What the business associate can do with data is, a, is whatever their covered entity customers allow them to do. So a lot of times those agreements constrain much more carefully that they have this kind of derivative status where they can't do all the things that HIPAA allows a covered entity to do unless their business associate agreement says they can. And in the case of public health and healthcare oversight reporting today, OCR said, don't worry about your business associate agreements. For the period of this national emergency, if you wanna participate in reporting, do it, do it securely, let your customers know you're doing it. Okay, I, I like what Dan was saying there, although I was being attacked by my son in the middle, so I didn't catch all of it. But that made the podcast. <laughs> oh man, uh, well, well, I, the good news is I had the sound turn, my mic turned off for that part. <laughs> but uh, uh, someone was writing about working from home and what I, you know, how, how to do it. I said, working from home is great, so you don't have your children, so the schools are open. But anyway, um, but, uh, but, but, you know, I've seen a couple of different approaches on the tech side to, you know, can we figure out ways to, to both change the health system change? I'm involved with this COVID event group and there are, there are others who are trying to figure out how can you convert facilities and, you know, inside hospitals and outside hospitals. Can you do more at home? You know, can you do more testing at home or whatever? Can you do testing in parking lots? But uh, there doesn't seem to be, you know, quite the same effort than probably needs to be is to figure out where all the stuff that we need is which presumably is part of what is in this, uh, you said it's in availability or is in change healthcare or is elsewhere. And that obviously starts with empty beds, mm -hmm. ventilators, you know, staff, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of things, and then supplies. And, and as, as, you know, Grace, I think you pointed out early on, where the hell are the supplies? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I think the most earth shattering thing, the thing that broke me and drove me to tears this week. So I had mentioned I'm working on a volunteer, volunteer initiative sourcing uh, crowdfunding and using that crowdfunding money to source uh, masks, surgical supplies, and all different types of personal protective equipment for hospitals that have little to none on the front lines of, and in hotspot areas. There was a Forbes article that reported on the fact that we still are manufacturing and have massive supplies 
of masks and equipment that are still being actively sold and exported to foreign countries. I, I, my mind was blown because we as volunteers are piecemealing 100 masks here, 100 gowns there, 1,000 N95 masks and, and trying to ship them and, and clear them through customs um, from China and Singapore. Um, and I'm looking at this and how, how could this be? Even in New Jersey, my home state, the, the report said, I believe there were 43 million masks on the ground in New Jersey that were available for sale. And here I am in New Jersey, excited that we got, you know, a hundred or a thousand masks. Um, it's mind blowing. Yeah, and in World War II, Harry Truman uh, ran a presidential commission where he went around and stopped people profiteering. And I'm, you know, maybe we're at war. There's trouble with that. Anyway, uh, Kim, Dan, Michael, you're all trying to get him. So uh, one thing I haven't seen people talk about is that, you know, so they're building hospitals in New York and other places. In Ohio, I know they're talking about, you know, creating hospital regions so that they can direct patients to particular places. I'm wondering like, so what, whose networks are those in? So who's, who's paying for the care at the Javits Center and at what payment rates? If I'm sent to COVID hospital, it's out of my network for my normal health insurance plan. Am I gonna be built out of network? I, I've not seen any discussion of this. And it's gonna create lots of out-of-pocket expenses for uh, patients unless somebody really says, no, 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 we're just gonna do Medicare rates or something like that. And you're gonna accept it as payment in full or, Unless someone makes a declaration like that, we're going to come in for a lot of big surprises. Yeah, I wonder who, who is running the Japanese Center Hospital. I mean, what's the entity? The, the um, army, I think. The army. Oh, um, yeah. so, Michael. So um, I, I think one of the questions that hovers over this, we talk about the mask, we talk about a lot of other things, is the extent to which we're going to have social solidarity improve or not. You know, a lot of us, when the Affordable Care Act passed. Uh, thought that that would bring in everybody from all over the country. And we were shown very clearly that just because a particular piece of legislation, say, might be giving benefits to rural white people did not mean that they were not believing that the benefits were going to urban black people and voting <laughs> accordingly, right? And, and, and so... Uh, um, or other rural black people. If you right. read an article from Kentucky that Sarah Cliff wrote. Right. I, actually, huh? I actually wrote a piece in the 2012 uh, election about why Obamacare was good for white people and Forbes took it down as being racist. Um, and so what, what we don't know is whether or not, given the, the extraordinarily uh, propaganda uh, effectiveness nature of some of the right wing media, will this cause people to have more money for the safety net? Will it uh, produce a sense of us altogether? Or will we continue with the us versus them? And that's that's just a real question. And, and part of the reason we don't have uh, some of these other kinds of uh, uh, you know resources available is we have run a profitable health system. Right? It's profitable to have just-in-time supply chain. It's profitable to do elective procedures for my well-insured hip as opposed to your poorly insured diabetes and uh, uh, lung cancer, right? And does this change it? Uh, it changes it if our leaders uh, look at it and say it changes it. It changes it if the, if the national conversation changes it. But I'm not so certain that in this bifurcated uh, uh, political nature, it, it will do that. So, so we shall see whether we go back to making up for the fact that I had to shut down. I'll give you one last thing. I don't know whether some of you have noticed on TV, the ads from the Cancer Treatment Centers of America. I don't know if anybody else has seen those, but they're running ads that say, hey, we're open and ready to treat, even though all those other people are busy and not taking it, right? Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen any any uh, uh, coverage of that. And and I got emails from my nonprofit health system, even while they're canceling appointments, they somehow continued their marketing efforts for their uh, needed or perhaps unneeded genetic testing program, right? And I've so, seen that some uh, plastic surgeons. Hey, right. hey Michael, <laughs> I'll offer a uh, an optimistic data point or a couple okay. data points okay. that I heard yesterday, read, uh, saw a survey asking uh, both, uh, and they reported from both the Democratic and uh, Republican point of view, how supportive are you of the following shelter in place type measures, closing down uh, right. restaurants, uh, requiring people to stay in their homes. Uh, in the range, it was as high as 90% agreement on some of these items, and the lowest was that's in me. 60 that's me. That's my survival. Range. I'm a favorite survival. But after survival stops being, uh, 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 you know, thing, where am I going to be with my pocketbook and my taxes and my votes? And we shall see.
Well, let's, let's go to this because uh, I did know there was a great news article came out yesterday uh, from, from you, Mr. Ellison, saying that President Trump was encouraging people to go to, uh, rich people to go to for-profit uh, hospitals only. Was that right? Yeah. Okay. That, was your, that was your April Fool. Oh, let's cut that April Fool joke. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. But, but the, hiding behind this story is a hell of a point. Although, although you've got, people um, thought it was serious. Because it, it sounds like him. <laughs> well, the best April Fool's always sounds, <laughs> sounds yeah, like it could be real. Enough. Uh, I think yeah, most people are saying that April Fool's is downplayed this year because most people couldn't believe what the hell was happening in reality. <laughs> reality and, you know, we've had four years at least of reality and, uh, and, and craziness being conflated. Okay, but there is a serious point right behind this, which is if we're going to have 25, 30% of the country unemployed, Maybe you can go on Cobra. Good luck to find the eight hundred, nine hundred thousand bucks a month. You can do that. The twelve hundred bucks a month that the IRS is going to give, twelve hundred bucks one time payment the IRS is going to give you, isn't going to cover that. Maybe businesses will be able to keep going for a couple of months. Um, we, you know, if there's a V-shaped recovery, we get back. You know, everyone can walk out the door on May the fifteenth and start spending money the way they were before. It's all great. But realistically, this is probably you know we're going to go in the if you look to talk to some of the uh, folks on. On Wall Street, who look at this stuff, they think we're going in the hole for a long time. You can't just stop and start again. So that leads us back to, and you know, I'd love to keep, I, I want to keep finding on this question. I think things are going to change. This leads us back to the fact we have an election coming up in November. We have at least one major candidate for the Democratic nominee, even though it sounds like he's got, it looks like he's lost already, saying, talking about Medicare for all single payer. We always said, or well, Vic Fuchs always told me, in time, my original health economist professor, in times of crisis, you know, that you need a crisis is to change the US healthcare system. What do we think? Is this, is this a time of crisis or is everyone going to say, well, I trust President, you know, I'm with the 45% of people who still trust President Trump, which is the number I saw this morning, even though Fauci got a much higher number. You know, and therefore, it's all good. I'm going to stay in my lane and, uh, you know, those, those white rural areas will keep voting Republican. I don't know what I thought about if there's any change in the national mood. I think the economy is going to oversee uh, health care as, as it usually does. Getting out, of, getting out of the recession we're going to be in is going to trump anything we might do on health care reform. But go, and, go and back to our history, Kim. The 30s, we did Social Security. We did, we did all these things because we were in a massive depression. But we, we did Social Security, but we didn't do uh, universal health We nearly did universal health care, but it wasn't a big deal there. It, meant it, wasn't, it wasn't like you know, sending you bankrupt if you ended up in the hospital. To, to Matthew, there, there was an article that so, showed that this was a tough fight, even in Canada, even Britain. I can just see um, uh, saying, you know what, the one industry where people have jobs which is health insurance. We're going to put them all out of business over a five year transition uh, plan. And by the way, now that we've increased the national debt and we spent two trillion dollars bailing people out, we're going to put another trillion dollars into health care. And, 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 you know, we can't, we can't even get another stimulus bill that Nancy, in the middle of the crisis, Nancy Pelosi is, is proposing another stimulus and Senator McConnell is shutting it down and there's no national outcry from the people of Kentucky or elsewhere. So I think that, uh, that Mr. Sanders uh, perhaps mistakes Vermont for the rest of the country. Yeah, but, but employers won't be able to pay for health care anymore. They've been squealing about health care costs on their balance sheets even before this crisis. So if it's not, if we don't have a system that covers everybody and we're once again asking the employers to, 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 to do this through, through compensation incentives, I, I think that's a, that's a weak point now too, because do I hire more people or can I give the people I have health insurance? Well, right now you're laying people off. Right? So, but yeah. most, there are swathes of the economy which are just going to shut down and all, and all the services business yeah. businesses around that and i think you know the, i, I want to see what this plays out of next you know in the polling yeah. and in the public mood plays out as people you know go into month two month three of you know from full employment to, is it 25 percent, 30 percent? no one knows what the unemployment is it, you know and it's not just going to be it's not just you know poor people in service industries a bunch of startups and tech companies going to be shedding people as well i mean there's a there's a lot to be done here but as usual, Brian, care, it's the, Brian the, we can we you unmute yourself, Brian, and still talk. I think that people are going to be a lot more frantic in in six months, eight months than they are now, and that's going to drive a lot, a lot. I mean, look at just just the the fact that the U.S. most businesses in the U.S. don't cover sick sick leave days. And everywhere else in the developed world, that's taken for granted. 
that kind of social safety net is going to become a very, very important thing after this experience. And, it, and it's going to drive the kinds of social change that, that you just alluded to. There's no way it can. As bad as this is going to be, most people won't have huge healthcare expenses, but a lot of people are going to have substantially impacted pay cuts, paychecks. And so I think, uh, right, that what is going to do, their, do for their income and loss of income is going to drive their priority more than their health care is because most people aren't going to be hugely impacted. Hey, Matthew, right. uh, ask, me again when, ask me again when the election's over. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, ask Vince who won the election after the results in. That's a good gambler. Grace, you're trying to get in. I have to disagree because I, I need to pull everybody back. There's millions of people who are living with multiple comorbidities, chronic illness, diabetes, cancer, who rely on their health care, who are barely affording insulin and targeted therapies and their regular out-of-pocket costs for their care, um, who have lost their jobs, who have gone from a two salary to a single salary or a no salary home. Um, it's catastrophic. And how do you connect those patients to the care that they need now? Forget the election. I'm, I'm talking right now. We're looking, connecting people to whatever financial assistance. People are crowdsourcing medications that they might have laying on shelves. Um, it's, it's a disaster. It's, I'm if not you're, saying if it's you're not already a not, not, not well. I'm not saying it's not a problem, but it's always been a problem. You know, it's, healthcare has been hugely uh, a disaster for a, you know, it's that it's that 20% or 5% that have all the expenses. It's always been a problem for them. And people just have chosen to say, I don't care because that's not me. That's why we have universal health care coverage. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm but I am wondering, that works. We're, we're layering this on, you know, and, and I love everyone in the group to chime. We're layering this on 10 years of we kind of, we were told we were solving the Affordable Care Act for people who had pre-existing conditions to use by insurance. Then it turned out that insurance didn't really, you know, had massive co co-pays and deductibles come along with it. I mean, clearly better. There were some subsidies. The subsidies don't go very far. They don't cover you on Medicaid for half the states, the red states, because they didn't expand Medicaid. Um, and now that was taken as an excuse by everyone in the system, particularly on the provider side and the and the farmer side, to ramp up pricing to, to, to these incredible levels and again, the bullshit that we've seen with the, uh, with the balance with the uh, surprise billing and all that kind of stuff. So, I, you know, people weren't happy before this. You had another 15, 20%, 30 kicked off their employer health insurance if they had it. I, 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 you know, I'm kind of more on the Bryant side, but it may not happen. There are some projections, I think California said that uh, they think health insurance premiums are going to spike 40% next year. I mean, yeah, yeah. Health, health plans don't seem to be particularly worried about all this. They, that's exactly what I've read. Article in the Wall Street Journal last week, you know, expect your premium to go up 40% next year. I spoke, uh, sure, I spoke to someone. I saw it. They said, you know, uh, on the one hand, you're having the COVID-19. On the other hand, all these electric procedures that they pay for aren't happening. So right. from the health insurer's point of view, uh, you know, your, your population had 5% who were sick, but all those people who are going to get hip replacements or other things aren't getting that. So from their point of view, it may not be such an expense. I, no, I say, Mike, Michael, that's, that's going to be a pent-up demand over the next 18 months. Right. Right. I'm disappointed that the right wing think tanks have not urged Americans who are coming down with COVID-19 to be better shoppers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, they, you should be, oh, oh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> no, 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 Grace, Grace, aren't you already doing that? Aren't you, aren't you trying to get them to shop to the right, the right hospital with the right quality? Yeah, quality being denoted by if they got the right job. You should be shopping for the best deal on your I'm sure Seema is watching this podcast, so who knows? Everyone's shopping right now. People, people are dying. I'm being facetious, Grace. I'm being because because in fact, I mean, I mean, I want to be serious now for just a little bit. The fact that that you put in a fifteen hundred dollar deductible for emergency room visits in regular insurance policies was never anything that could be defended as shopping. It was punitive. It was cost shifting. It was defended as shopping. It was ridiculous. And what this fifteen hundred try eight thousand? Yeah, <laughs> been a long time since that fifteen hundred dollar deductible. Is that consumerist rhetoric is often divorced from reality by people who really don't care about reality? Well, I, I was saying grocery shopping because you have a new quality measure. Do they have the protective equipment or not? Right? Can they give you a mask when you go in? So if you think about it, so if you think about it, everyone's sitting home. 
for weeks now. We are, this is this is week three of homeschooling for us. Um, some places have been have been sheltering in uh, for a little bit longer than that. But think about the anxiety as you're watching the reports and you're hearing the, the pleas for additional equipment from government leadership or governments and our, and our mayors. Um, and you look at your local hospitals, how do you know as a patient where it's a hot mess express and you should not go near there? Mm -hmm. um, we had four hospitals close and not, not close, but not accept new patients in the emergency room temporarily. They said they're not in a state of crisis. They're just overwhelmed and they're going to divert. Um, so what does that mean for a patient if you're diverting? Uh, again, out-of-pocket costs, what does that look like? How cool would it be if we had a tool uh, that would allow us to look and if my mom called me or if my friend called me and said, hey, I'm having shortness of breath, I think I need to go to the ER. I did the telemedicine consult, they said get to the ER. If I could just look up and at least have a, a rough idea of what I'm walking into. We, it's not a technology, lack of technology, it's a matter of why we're not doing it. So do we not wanna cause hysteria? Do we not wanna show what kinds of gaps we have in care? Um, I, I think we could easily get some type of a system up there, but why aren't we doing it? That's the interesting conversation. There was an article in the Times yesterday about, you know, some places you have a hard time getting tests and when you get them, you have to wait 10 days for results. Other places you have to get a result later. Why don't consumers know this? Why aren't they being steered to the places that have the most easily quickest available tests in their area? Because Dan hasn't built the hey, system I'm we gonna, talked about earlier, right? <laughs> I, I'm going to speak a little out of character here. I, I see the hospitals just overwhelmed with uh, caring for people right now. I, I wouldn't ex be expecting any uh, <laughs> any new price lists. Well, I mean, I, there is an. Actually, I would like to get Dan on that. I mean, Dan, you talked about building the system where you could report on on some of these things. There is there is a bunch of stuff going on, right? There's a company called Audacious Inquiry, which is trying to build a fire-based, there's a technology-based system to try to report out some of this, some of this stuff and, and try to sort of figure out from ADT systems which beds are available. Um, a number of other, uh, I know Palantir is, which is the sort of the half healthcare, half spy CIA, you know, tech company that Peter Thiel started. They're, they're doing some stuff to try to help a bunch of different health systems across the world look at supply and demand and chain. But I mean, it seems to me that it's still very much, you know, the, the governor of New York saying, we think we need more ventilators and where are they? You know, we don't have a, we don't have a, a really in tune defense wartime type supply system. So, I mean, Dan, you, you talked about how it might be put together. What's your guess on whether we're going to get one and how long it will take? You mean for public health reporting? Well, I mean, public health reporting, but in that public health reporting, you know, are we going to be talking about equipment and other stuff? Yeah. I, you know, my, my sense of this is, given the timelines that we're trying to work with, you don't want to try to solve everything and you don't want to try to solve really tough stuff and you want to try to build from what we already have. There are already several syndromic surveillance systems that are out there, there's electronic lab reporting, uh, there's reporting from the ED, there's case reporting. It's all flawed and incomplete, but the some of the rails are laid. And so given that we're going to need to make some decisions about when we can relax social distancing in particular areas, for example, within 30 to 60 days, it's not the time to run the sort of Iowa caucus play and invent a new app that's going to solve everything. <laughs> it's the time to use the stuff that's on the shelf and just needs an improvement. And so if we can build from some of those existing systems that the CDC started laying down after 9-11 for sort of bioterror surveillance, uh, some of which are already plugged into 60, 70% of EDs, for example, we can use the lab reporting that we already built out during the meaningful use era. We're already at the 50, 60 yard line, uh, just to mix up my metaphors here. And we can, and it, we're a lot closer to get something that'll be 80, 90% good enough so that we can make decisions in a lot of markets. We need to get Dan and Devin working on this thing. Yeah, well, they, they, have, they, have, yeah, they have time after this call. They can <laughs> get, a, get a, no one cares about getting better. Give us a couple of hours, we'll get back to you. I, I have a, I have another comment I'm going to add to Devin or someone's to-do list. So I have an interesting thing, thing that came up. So once a patient is in ICU and is sedated and on a respirator, uh, excuse me, on a ventilator, um, what the families are not allowed in the hospital are not allowed at the bedside, which is extremely traumatic. Uh, so people are messaging and text messaging their loved one. So usually when you're in the hospital, your loved one can be set with the phone on the bedside. But what's happening is people are literally dying, and this is not a new thing, with messages that are not read. 
But because of the unique circumstances here where you're not allowed to have interaction, um, patients have, and their families are asking, can someone read my messages to my loved one? Um, even if they're sedated, um, can someone relay that? And I was asking Devin, how do you even begin to do this? What are the, 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 the privacy complications? Because it sounds like something so powerful, um, but how do we oper operationalize that or can we? Yeah, I mean, this, this is one of those situations where somebody will come up and say, HIPAA won't allow them to do that. And at that point, mm -hmm. I, I will explode. Because that's what's happening. That's what's happening. Was people are saying, well, 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 there, there is well, a, a, an administrative and there's a workflow and a burden thing. I mean, do doctors and nurses don't they already have enough on their plate? Um, but I mean, it, 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 yeah, I mean, it's one thing to tell people they're required to do it. It's another thing to reassure a nurse who wants to be able to read those messages at the bedside that there are no HIPAA obstacles to her doing so, and there are none. I mean, you're basically reading the patient's information to the patient. So it really shouldn't be a problem. There might be other issues around, you know, cell phones, but I, I wouldn't say it's a forced issue. People are busy, but if somebody takes it, you know, the goodness of their heart says, wow, this patient is dying. Their family would really like them to hear these things and they want to, and they, and they can access that data. It's not locked, then go for it. There's no HIPAA obstacle there. Grace, are they being treated differently than uh, they would with other infectious diseases? Has that happened before or before? You know, I, I don't think I personally have never witnessed this where, uh, so I work mostly in, in, can, in the cancer space and there are cardiology and, and other issues, but um, I, I haven't seen this where you're not allowed at all, even at end of life. Um, I have seen people FaceTiming with their loved ones to say goodbye. Um, literally no inside contact um, with any family member. Nurses are, and doctors are holding the patient's hand in some cases um, as people die from, from COVID. So um, I'm looking for simple solutions again. Uh, how can we bridge this gap? Because it right away is a HIPAA and privacy thing, but what can I tell patients? What can we disseminate? Because this is something we've never encountered, but what type of powerful closure could you get and, and to deal with that grief later that maybe you sent a message and your loved one never got it? It's well, an good, interesting conversation. Yeah, the good news is at least now most of those phones you can put your fingerprint on to actually open it up instead of having to try and figure out what the password was to even read that message, but I'm with you. All right, so we've just got a, a, a cut of three minutes left on the, on the live cast here. So um, we've covered a lot of topics today, <laughs> going all the way from, you know, the, what do you do with messaging right at the end of life, starting off with uh, uh, talking about surveillance, starting off with uh, the, the, the issues around keeping physician practices alive, and what's it going to do with, what's it going to do with uh, to the politics of Medicare for all. Real quick, um, what are we going to see in the next week that we're not talking about yet? And I just want a couple of words from everyone I want to start with, because he's looking... He brought his mask and he, that was his that was his this week is, is Vince. I'll start with you. Yeah. So the issue I'm flagging is now we're beginning to see uh, tests available and we're beginning to see masks and ventilators. And my my uh, what I think we're going to see in the next week is the politiza politization of where do these go? Uh, and there really is hard to make a scientific answer. I saw Vice President Pence making a pitch that they go to southern states as a preventive <laughs> measure. Not, not Michigan, right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Kim, what are we going to see next week? I think uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of mini New Yorks, and that's going to open a lot of people's eyes, particularly in some of the red states. Michael. I, I agree with Kim. I think that as things get bad, because we have leaders who are not very good at social solidarity and, and, and you know, drive people apart instead that we're gonna have a lot of rancor and angst until uh, we are able to pull together. Devin, your forecast for the next week. Oh, God. That, uh, those all, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more on how we're gonna prepare to actually have an election in November. <laughs> Brian, next week, what are we gonna do about? Um, I'm worried about, among other things, the system melting down and the long-term geopolitical implications of countries in Asia pulling this off so well comparatively and us running around like chickens with our heads cut off and what that actually means for the future. You know, Taiwan has a good single-payer system invented by Americans, but <laughs> go on, Dan. <laughs> 
for the next week. We're going to see a trickle of more stories about hospitals and physician practices groups laying off workers, and they'll be sort of overinterpreted as a collapse in revenue and a uh, and a disaster for the healthcare system. And then a few weeks later, hospitals are going to have more patients than more reimbursable patients than they know what to do with. Um, and by the end of the year, revenue will be up, not down. Hmm. Grace, you, you'll get some hear. I'm hoping we hear more about antibody tests. We know that there's asymptomatic carriers of this infection and virus, and people ha may have had no symptoms and have had it and have antibodies. I believe United Biomedical is currently doing a local test in San Miguel County in uh, Colorado, um, testing their technology, which I believe was tested overseas and is, and is pretty reliable. I'm, I'm hoping to see more of that information so we can see how we can all start safely, perhaps uh, getting back out there with, with antibodies. Okay, the last one, I, the, the, my, my conclusion to this, I think we're gonna hear a lot more in the next week about now that people are, are going to be treated at home and try to get, get them out of the emergency room, are we gonna be doing a lot, a lot more thinking about how are we gonna surveil, do surveillance and measurement and more of this remote patient monitoring at home um, and try to figure out people's sat levels so that they don't get to the ER before they need to. Um, and who's gonna be in charge of that? Because we don't really have a proper home care system in this country and maybe we're gonna invent one in the next couple of weeks, we'll see. All right, we have got to the end of our 55 minutes. I'm trying to keep these under an hour each time. I wanna really thank everyone who, everybody who came on and I will put the list up. Everyone's faces will disappear. But this has been the third episode of THCB Gang, and you can find the people. Sorry, if you can share the. Uh, here we go. You should be able to see it now. You can find the people on Twitter. They're all very active and all a great follow. I want to thank Kim Ballard, Grace Cordovano, um, Brian Clapper, Vince Caredes, Devin McGraw um, at Health Privacy you know, with her OCR background. We don't talk a lot about the, the OCR enough <laughs> these days. Uh, Mike Millison from Chicago and down in the hill from San Francisco, but also an of Jeff Fellow. Hey, gang, thank you very much for this episode. Look forward to it. We well will see all. you thank same you. time, same place, Thursday at 1 o'clock um, Eastern. Sorry, 1 o'clock uh, Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern, next Thursday. This is the THCB gang, Matthew Holt, signing off. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks.